All right, here we go. Catching up with Lonnie Pallister. How you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. Where, where are you right now? I just got home from training, um, just in my house, so pretty chill, which is nice. Relax for the rest of the weekend and finish trying to recover from trials and, yeah, just chill out, unpack, do all those fun you, things. You live on the Gold Coast? I do, yeah. We're up yeah. Paradise Point End, so if you're at uh, the Gold Coast Aquatic Centre where we held the Nationals, it's 15 minutes back towards Brisbane. Oh, okay. Beautiful. Yeah, Good yeah it's spot. a nice area. Like the sunny coast, it's like a little bit more quiet than the rest of the Gold Coast. So, the yeah. parents. Yeah. Now, what's recovery like uh, for a distance swimmer at the end of a long meet like that? You've, you've swum some miles during during that week. So, what's the recovery for you? Um. So, I had Monday morning off and Monday night. So, I did nothing Monday um, just to let myself recover from the 1500. Normally, I feel pretty dreadful after that one um and then we were straight back into it tuesday so we did double sessions tuesday swimming wednesday gym wednesday doubles thursday swimming friday gym friday and then a main set this morning and gym this morning so pretty much a full week except for the one day um yeah post racing when do you start to feel yourself again does it take a few days yeah um i don't think i felt myself at trials like uh, that melbourne pool sucked i'm really sorry it was, <laughs> like, it's a really nice complex but i think racing indoor comparatively to racing outdoor is such a different mm. thing um so yeah i think i felt pretty much the exact same coming back from melbourne back into training um so it was more just you know getting over the lactate that you build in a 1500 and um getting straight back into some you know chunky k's and more negative split work and that sort of thing, gearing up for worlds. Because I think my program, if I heat and final and everything that I've entered in, will be five and a half K of racing. So have to go straight back into some pretty big kilometers, I guess, to mm. account mm. for that. Now, I'm just looking at you right now. You don't look like the average distance swimmer. You look more like a sprinter. You're jacked. <laughs> Hell yeah, look at that. Gym is so much fun. Um, and... I feel I look the exact same as I did last year, um, but it's something that I've done the whole way along. And even when I was like, I have photos of myself when I was a little kid and I was still mm. really muscly then before I'd started any sort of gym work. And right. my mom was incredibly muscly when she was swimming and she still outlifts me in the gym from what she did when she was um, training. And then my dad also did swimming, so life-saving and triathlon. So I think the genetics for me are fairly, not fairly easy to build muscle, but it's not been something that I've struggled with to put on. Yeah, yeah. Now, for those that don't know the history, you, uh, me and your mum have some history. We go back. We go back a long way in terms of uh, we shared the pool together back when we yeah. were younger. Uh, I don't know how much of the pool we actually shared, though, because your mum was uh, the, the greatest distance swimmer in, a, in, in Australia at the time, and I was an up-and-coming sprinter, and I spent a lot of time uh running away from the type of workout that she was doing you know like i was i was hiding in the showers a lot but your mom was uh your mom was a star distance swimmer man she was good yeah she still has top top 10 australian all-time times i mm. think it's um i think she'd be close in the 1500 as well so it's pretty crazy like 32 years on that she's had a daughter swimming the exact same events um and yeah swimming similar times i think it's pretty weird. I don't think many other people have done the exact same thing. So her PB in the 1500 was like 1608 without a suit back then. I think mm. she went 24, which honestly like almost beat me at trials. I think I was like 820. <laughs> so four second buffer with a suit. It's like pretty much the exact same thing. Um, <laughs> but yeah, she's incredible. She's been there like the whole way along. And I think her training that way and I guess learning from that era of swimming and bringing it into now has been really important for me in my development because there's absolutely no chance that I'd survive if I did the work that she had to do back then yeah she she did a lot of work I'll tell you that she was tough as nails too man she never complained she just it was always like she was just churning up and down the pool and I was like how does she do this like I couldn't I couldn't fathom and I didn't even know what I was doing in the same squad as her you know <laughs> but uh but we were together you know it was a big group but but she was there just smashing out the yardage all the time and and killing it um yeah. but did, have, has she did she record those things did she show you her log books and things like that I actually went through her log books 
maybe at the end of last year just to have a look to like have a little look see through them and she's got all of them the whole way through her career wow. and there was one session i opened up and i think it was like 16 400s or 16 400s fly she tells us a story like that all the time mm. and they got to halfway and someone missed the time so they had to start all over again um oh, wow. So wow. Some, of the, some of the k's that she did were just insane i think she was between 100 and 120 kilometers yeah. away she yeah. never had trouble injuries um never had any sort of issues like that so i guess i'm fairly lucky that i'm the same like i haven't had shoulder problems or anything like that in my career the only thing i've had was i broke broke my toes jumping over a fence down in melbourne at short course in 2018 and that was just because hmm. i was an idiot and <laughs> yeah so nothing else has ever been an issue for me but um yeah i couldn't don't think i'd be able to cope with some of the work that um dick made them do she never had any PTSD where, you know, she saw you going into that direction and was like, no, no, stay away from that. Don't, don't go there. I think she, when I was younger and I said, like, I wanted to swim, she, not that she was against it, but was like, oh, you know, like if there's other sports there, like you can do it. <laughs> um, and then I was adamant that I was swimming 100 and 200 butterfly when I was younger. So up until I was like 13 or 14, they were my two main events. And I had like postcards from Jess Shipper that I remember getting and, I think I went like a 101 and maybe like a 215. So like I was pretty decent at butterfly when I was younger. And then there was a random like, um, just like a preparation meet for like Queensland States or something when I was young. And mom gave me the program and was like, highlight what events you want to swim. And I thought I'd highlighted the 100 butterfly, but I'd highlighted the 800 freestyle on accident. Mm. So she entered <laughs> me in it. And then on the day I was like, what am I doing in that? And she was like, mm. well, you highlighted it. I was like, that's definitely not what I thought I was entering. And because she paid the entry fee, she was like, well, you can swim it. And I remember being in the marshalling room, like bawling my eyes out, like adamant that I wasn't going to swim this race. And then the first time I swam it, I qualified for state. And then at states, I was second and qualified for nationals. And then I ended up first or second at nationals that year. So wow. it's kind of weird going from being adamant against swimming it into it now being one of my main events and being in that distance freestyle space. So I do wish my butterfly had have stayed around for a little bit longer. I haven't touched it or raced it in years, but I think it'd be something fun to get back in and do. And I don't know, like an off season or at a random meet outside of a world's preparation and just mm. go have fun with something that's not distance freestyle. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think's changed and what do you think stayed the same in those 34 years since your mum was winning national titles? I mean, there are, there's obviously, um, a, a type of work that you need to do to be a distance swimmer, right? Like you can't avoid it. You, you got to do yardage, <laughs> right? And, and, it's, and you've got to put in the miles and you've got to have a certain tenacity and you've got to have, you got to be self motivated. Like you can't have people, you know, pushing you out of bed in the morning. You got to get yourself out and do that, all that sort of stuff. So there's, there's things that have obviously remained the same. And then there's obviously things that have changed and shifted, you know, women are swimming much faster now than, than they were um so what, what do you think the, the things are there i think one of the main things that's changed is the way that we or the way that i race it anyway so mum when she used to race would race fairly even she'd go out in her 400 pb plus two and come back in her 400 pb plus four um so maybe that was the case that they used to swim so i think i'm maybe sit around 60 to 70 so she did an extra 50 kilometers on top of me mm. um, and the way that she split her races was so even, whereas I go out a little bit harder and see how long I can hold on. So it's a little bit different, but I think the whole way along, like distance and the quality that you do the main sets at is the same. And I think that maybe the total volume of caves has changed for certain athletes. Right. Yeah. I think it's right, more, right. especially like in my upbringing, when mum was coaching me um, full time, it was quality over quantity rather than just smashing out endless caves in the pool. Right. So instead of 16 400s butterfly, what what what's the type of work that you're doing now? Um I feel like it's pretty standard for like a lot of distance swimmers like the 3100s right. set with different variations or 50s on short rest, um step tests with 72s or 104s like it's sort of things like that where it's not just endless Ks like the volume's still there but the intensity through the set drops and mm. like I a fair bit of speed work considering I go from the 200 to the 1500. So I guess my preparation compared to, I guess, like Moesha Johnson, who's on the team for the um, 1500 and the 5k is like so different. 
Yeah, yeah. I will say this. The, the 31s has been around forever. I mean, ev everybody does 31s around the world uh, and, and slightly different variations. But I know there's Americans that have nightmares about that. They're, every coach in America is doing it. So it's like at some point, uh, you know, where are we in terms of the, the progression of, of distance swimming? I, I guess what you've said now is that the, the quality has come up. So the, the distance, the, the amount of distance is coming down. I think that's, that's kind of been a major shift in terms of, you know, it's more race pace training now. Right. And so, um, but, but 31 seems to have been around forever too. Honestly, that set has grown on me a lot as I've gotten older. I remember I was on a camp and I was fairly young at this point and I think after the 2020 COVID lockdown, I was a lot more willing to do a lot more hard work. I think, you know, when you're an age grouper, it's really easy to, I guess, train one way and you still almost race better than you train. But as you get older and you develop and you mature a little bit, I think your training ends up becoming a lot um, more specific and I guess at a higher intensity right. and probably race at a similar level to how you train rather than racing better than training. So mm -hmm. we were... Uh, and it was meant to be all 3100's best average. And I was like bawling my eyes out, trying to convince them to let me go and do the sprint set. I was like, I'm not doing this. I've never done this before in my life. I think I'd done that set maybe like once or twice. Um, and then we got to the point where I was allowed to do it as one recovery, one best average. Right. And I still cried my way through the whole set. <laughs> but now I'd like, if Bolly puts it on the board now, like I'm just not phased. I'm like, yeah, okay, cool. And we just go and come with it. Well, what's your best experience with it then? Where, where, what's a workout when you've done that set where you've like, that's the best I've done at that? Um, I think the best that I've done it was maybe last year on event camp. And it was, so it was like all distance swimmers. Um, and it was 31s in blocks of 10. And it was, ne you had to negative split them. So like if you didn't, negative split the hundred you added another one on mm. and I was holding like one or ones still negative split and I maybe missed I think I missed five so I added five but one of the girls missed 27 of the 30 so she was oh, meant wow. to add an extra 27 but I don't think oh, she wow. ended up adding them so like regardless how fast she went and how slow she like played with different times the whole way and just like couldn't do the negative split on it so that week was also probably one of the most traumatic weeks of my life. There was just so many Ks on it. This was two years ago, sorry. So many Ks on it. And um, we did like 1,500 time trials or like a 2K time trial straight into 15 ones best average short rest. So um, I think now it's just kind of not monotonous, but the times that you do either stay the same or they're a little bit better. Or for me anyway, that's what I like to do is I look at the last time I've done it and try and improve on that. But it's not something that I look at as like a key set in my preparation and think like mm. I've done that, that I'm going to train really well. Right. Right. Yeah. Race really, race. race really well. Yeah. Um, I just had a thought too. Sometimes I have these thoughts and they come in and, and disappear, you know, but uh, I had this thought about, um, you know, just the idea of like, you know, you being out there doing this alone, like when the, everybody wants to sprint, right? But not everybody wants to be a distance swimmer. Not everybody can yeah. handle that. So yeah. like, how do you, with the personality that you have, which is really outgoing, how do you do the grind alone? I actually really enjoy it. I said, I think I was speaking to Emma McKean about this on Tuesday and she said pretty much the exact same thing with it. Like not everyone wants to swim distance, but everyone mm. wishes they could the hundred. Right. And I wish I could race the hundred, but I don't think the work for the hundred would be as fulfilling to me as doing, I guess like a bigger, chunkier set. Like if mm. I looked at the and had, I'm not hundred percent sure how sprint free training works. I have no, no <laughs> idea. But if I saw like 25s max and 35s max, I can't get my stroke rate high enough. My lactate doesn't peak that quickly. And like mentally for me, it's not as fulfilling as doing like a 300 time trial straight into other like things on top of it. So I think it's more the feeling that you have when you've gotten to the end of a really big set being like, okay, well, like I've done that. And I think it's something that's a lot more, I guess, mentally fulfilling for me rather than just doing a 25. Yeah. It's got like a 0.1 deviation, like in distance, yeah. if you add maybe 10% on your 1500 time, there's almost like 30 seconds. So I think it's 
a lot harder to hit it because it can go so wrong with how long the event is. Whereas I think it's a lot more catastrophized in a hundred because if you're 0.4 over, like that's a lot in a hundred meters. Yeah. yeah. If you're like one second over in a 1500. It's almost nothing. So I think that, I don't know, my mentality towards it is so different. And I was adamant against swimming distance when I was younger. And now that I've done it more, more and more, I think the 1500 is probably my favorite event out of the three of them. It'll probably go 1500. 400 800 i haven't put together a good 800 in forever so just waiting for that one to come now but yeah if i look at the board and there's a set that looks scary i think i get a little bit more excited for it because by the end of it it's like yeah wow and i'm really impressed with myself that way rather than just doing max efforts Mm. that's what i was going to say to you actually i remember now in terms of there's not much difference between how you coach 100 freestyle or how you coach a 1500 freestyle there's, there's really no difference the end result is you want to be consistent as possible and you want to hold the pace that you want to hold in a race for as long as you can in practice but you want to get comfortable with that pace yeah. so if you're if you're a cam mcavoy right now who's just training for the 50 what he's trying to do is he's trying to go short distances but he's trying to be within a hundredth of a second of where he wants to be on race day for for a very short distance. Right. And then he wants to repeat that and repeat that and repeat that. And it's the same thing with you. What you're, what you're ultimately doing effectively is just you're getting on a pace and you're feeling comfortable with that pace so that when you go out in race day, you're like, you know, exactly what you're splitting, you know, down, down to the, down to the hundredth, really down to the 10th. You know, I've seen distance swimmers and they'll be like, you know, for instance, they'll be like 29.56, 29.55, 29.55, 29.56. I'm like, how are you getting it to the hundredth and you're swimming a full 50? But but you got, you you understand your pace now, don't you? You can feel it. I think, especially mom drilled that into me when I was younger, was hitting the pace, hitting the stroke rate. Right, right. And what the stroke rate is before she told me. Um, and yeah. that's so easy for me to go through different races and be able to hold I think the 200 is probably like 46 or 47 rate whereas my 800 1500 is maybe 42 to 43 so I hold a fairly high rate because I don't kick anywhere near as much as I guess like Ariana or Katie but that's also because my pull is better than my kick in training like when they're isolated on their own but I think once you get on one pace especially after like the first 100 of a set you kind of know like how it feels and what it should feel like on the next rep. And it's a lot easier to replicate than going just like all out. Yeah. 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 But you, you get comfortable with it. And I think you're, you're probably at a stage in your career now where you wouldn't even have to ask coach uh, out of a race, like what were my splits? You know, like it, it's, you, you would have a fairly good idea of like, on lap three, I was this. On lap six, I was that. On lap eight, I was that. Like you would, you would pretty know, pretty, pretty much know the the tenth, how close you were on some of those splits, right? Yeah, I think you can also feel it when in distance swimming, especially when I'm swimming the fifteen hundred. If I don't feel like I'm gonna throw up at the seven hundred and fifty meter mark, like I've swum it wrong. Like it gets to a point where you feel like you're gonna throw up in the middle of the race, and then you get past it and you move on. Um, which is completely different to like sprint freestyle. It's just like a whole body blow up, can't move. Mm. Um, but I saw my split of the first hundred of my 15 at trials. And I think it was like 58, nine. And I was like, Oh, this one's going to hurt just because like I went out a lot faster than I expected. <laughs> um, and then I think I was 823 feet on wall. And in the individual 800, I was 820. So you kind of get used to like, as it gets longer, you pretty much right. stay at the same pace, like regardless of what like extra distance is. I think there was, well, the 800 was maybe like 103 average or 102 and a bit, whereas my 15 was maybe like 103 and a bit. There's not much difference yeah. between like the eight and the 15 um, comparatively to like the four and the eight. So yeah, I think it's just something that you get used to is just hitting pace bang on because if you're not able to do it in training, like you're not going to be able to do it in a race anyway. So I think it's something yeah. that you learn to do as you keep doing those chunkier sets especially like 30 50s just continuous or stuff like that yeah i mean you talk about the 1500 you know you're you're starting to 
rack up titles. You're starting to rack up wins and you're starting to feel comfortable in that event. There was a period of time on the international stage where it was Kayla Decky and daylight between her and, and anybody else. There was not even anybody else in the conversation. You're, you're starting to put yourself in the conversation of like, you can contend to, to win this thing, you know, like, but there was, there was nobody for years. Are you starting to get that sense yourself? Like you're putting yourself in the conversation now? I think yes and no. I think Katie's still very much in a league of her own, like her best time is still, so it's fifteen twenty, which is, I think it was 24 seconds faster than second place at world championships last year. So as much as I like to think that I'm putting myself in that realm, like I know I still have a lot more work to do it, a lot more work that's coming in order to try and start hitting times like that. Um, I think it's something that comes with age as well. When you start doing that event more and more and getting more comfortable with racing it and playing with different race strategies, uh, it gets a lot easier. I think I was fairly confident at short course last year um, because I'd raced a couple 1500s long course and then went straight into a 1500 short course and then raced short course worlds, whereas I haven't raced a 1500 long course until trials this year almost a complete year ago. So it was a completely different feeling, but yeah, it's really odd to be put in, I guess, the same sentence as Katie, because I remember watching her break the world record, I think in the 400 freestyle when I was like 14 over watching US nationals. So even just being in the same pool as her as racing is really incredible. And it's kind of like eye opening for me that I've gotten myself to that level to be able to, you know, experience the things that I was dreaming of when I was 14. But, um, I think she's still got a little bit of a choke hold on it at the moment. Like we'll see what happens at nationals next week. And I'm excited to go to worlds and just hopefully improve again, throw PB down. We'll see. <laughs> but I think all you can expect is your best. And if you put your best together on the day, then that's all that matters. How are you getting to that point now? Like when, when I turned professional as, as a swimmer, I, Put a lot of pressure on myself to start to get consistent results right like I, I was dealing with hundreds of seconds as a 50 meter swimmer and i knew that in order to be in the conversation at the world championships at the olympic games on a consistent basis it didn't matter what time it was what day it was where it was i had to show up and perform are you starting to get to that that level now of like it doesn't really matter how I feel. It doesn't really matter if I hit my taper. It doesn't really matter the work I've done. But, like, mentally, I'm going to show up and get it done no matter what. I think that's how I felt. This year and last year for me have been polar opposites. I think last year, after the year I had in 2021, like, last year, all I wanted was to make the team. I didn't care what times I swam. Like, right. all I cared about was being top two at Australian champs. And then whatever happened at world champs was a bonus on top of that. So really all I wanted was to come back from having five months off and just want to put my best foot forward. And if that was top two, then I'd be on the team and I'd get to travel and experience that. And then if it wasn't, I considered moving, um, in my mind anyway, I'd considered moving to the States and going and doing a college program so that I wasn't putting that same amount of pressure on myself to, you know, mm. be on the, because I missed four teams in a row by one spot from 2018 to 2021 like I missed wow. 18 I was third um Pam Pax oh no Com Games 18 I was fourth Pam Pack trials that year I was third mm. um World's Trials 2019 I was third in the four eight and 15 and then I think 2021 Olympic trials like my year just fell apart and I was third or fourth there as well so I've gotten to the point where I constantly felt like I wasn't enough because I was right. just yeah, and like those girls were older and better and faster than me. So until I really got past that, I guess, mindset and look at us as we're all the same person, like we're all the same, mm. um, really nothing that's separating us. Like, yeah, cool, they're older, but it doesn't make a difference. And I think once you get past that mentally, then racing them becomes a lot easier. Um, and then this year at trials, I just wanted to get the job done. I was... All I wanted was the 4, 8, and 15 individually so I could swim them again at Worlds. Um, I think I was probably more nervous for the 200, considering the depth that they've got in Australia at the moment. Um, mm. I was like the anchor, the 4 by 2 at Short Course Worlds last year. I was devastated that I wasn't part of it at Com Games. Um, and those girls ended up breaking the world record. So I was really sad that Long Force I didn't get that opportunity. And then 
um, Dina Bowley put me anchoring at short course and I split a 152.2 and individually like the meet before I think I was 153.8 so massive wow. difference in times that I honestly think it was just because it was a relay swim and I find it a lot easier to race like the 100 200 on a relay than it is individually um I was looking back at some of the races I did when I was like 17 years old in a four by one at junior pan packs and I'd be a 55 oh straight off the back of a 1500 and I was like okay why haven't I hit that in a normal like 100 freestyle mm, so right. I really enjoy relay swimming so going into that event I think I just told myself that if I make it past the heat then like I'm in with a shot and to make that final was nuts I don't think it's been that fast ever in Australian history you have to be 157 mid to make the final last year was 158 high and I think in 2019 it was like a 158 more maybe 158.8 or 159 to make the final so mm. the progression the women have had in the 200 especially in Australia is just insane and then the final obviously Molly and Arnie had their race and that was so cool um and both of them being well, I think Molly was 53 Arnie was 54.1 and yeah. then I was 56.0 um Maddie Wilson was 56 two or three Kia was 56 mid Shana Jack was 56 mid. So there's so many of us that have, have the ability to race that relay at Worlds. So yeah, it's um it's exciting and it's cool to be in that conversation. But I guess we won't know until the week of what happens with that one. But um yeah, it's a pretty prestigious relay to hopefully be a part of, regardless of if it's a heat summer yeah. or not. But um yeah, bit of fun. Yeah. The Australian women are so strong right now. I mean, I think I think they're the most respected group in the world just just from from what you guys have depth wise on that australian women's team um it, it feels like it's it's a like a you know what's the word um you know it's the team to be it's like you walk on deck and it's like everybody's going to pay attention like that's the team you want to be on that australian women's team you know and, and you're part of that like it, do you feel that do, do you as women get a sense like you're you're the it team right now I mean, I can't speak for everyone, but I think just being part of the Australian like swimming team and then being like a woman on that team is so incredible with the dominance that they've had in the relay, like the four by one relay. Right. Um, and that constantly the team changing, but still being so successful. And then you've got Kaylee, who's broken to well, holds the world record of 100 to 200 backstroke. Right. Yeah. Um, Lizzie Deck is one of 205 to fly, and there's not many people that go down to that level. Um, obviously Emma and Ariane and there's so many people in so many different events that are between world number one and number five and it was just crazy that the qualifying times that we had for the women's were based on I think top top eight I'm not 100% sure how they work I just get told the time and force myself <laughs> I just, just do it <laughs> you have to do. Um, but there's between like three and five people that make that call time every time yeah, yeah. which is when it's based on top eight on the world, like to the time from the semi-final to make the final, like that's really fast. And if you have mm. five very constantly making that, then even when like the next people retire, the next generation retire and start coming through, you know, the people are still going to be hitting those times and still holding that standard that I guess the Australian women have created. Yeah. Yeah. I like the balance that you've, you've given yourself too. like you, you do surf lifesaving and not, not many Americans really fully understand what that means, but it's uh, it's part of the Australian culture. You do the surf lifesaving. seems like you do some open water swims as well. So it's like, you don't spend all your time, you know, stuck in the pool, do you? Yeah. Last year, I think I was very like one track minded with pool swimming and I went to where did I go? I went to Italy for surf life saving um, in October of last year. And I think it was the one meet that I'd asked to do because it was another international travel and it was an Australian team. So right. I have like an Australian number, a Australian senior number in two different teams. So I've got mm. the Dolphins number, which is 830. And then in the surf, I'm 487. So my dad has also got his Australian cap number for surf life saving. And then mm. mom's also got the pool number so it's kind of special to have a bit of both of them um mm. and then yeah over the summer i did heaps of racing outside of the pool because i think i didn't want to focus on times i didn't want right. to have time pressure and i guess the constant comparison and the surf race at surf life saving it was 
also 400 meters. So it's still like the same race distance, just in a different set of conditions, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it was really good. I, how many did I do? I did an Alex Brown at Alexandra Headlands, which is on the Sunshine Coast in Queensland mm -hmm. um, in December, like 10 days out of World Champs, I think. And then I did Peter Pub in January, which is a 1.2K ocean swim down in Victoria in Melbourne. It's like Great Ocean Road kind of area. Um, and then mm. I went to Manly for another summer of surf round, which is in Sydney. Um, and then Sunshine Coast for another one. I did two rounds on the Gold Coast during our event camp. Swimming Oz actually let me leave camp on the front, which I was so shocked they let me go. I didn't think they'd let me leave, you know, the national training camp to go and race in the surf. But I raced all day Friday and all day Saturday at that one. Um, and then we went and did our camp in Numea with Bolly for two weeks. That was our two-week, like, swimming training camp. And I flew straight from Numea. I flew into Sydney and then went straight from Sydney to Perth, landed in Perth at, like, close to midnight, got up and mm. trained in the morning at 4.30 with one of the open water squads over there. Then trained from like, I think it was five o'clock in the water to seven and then raced from eight to four, trained at night, did at that for the next five days. So that I was, wasn't missing any sort of training by going and doing these races. It wasn't like an extra add on, but just going and doing like the race practice and having like a race plan and executing it in a different environment, I think for me was more important mentally than it was physically. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, um, I never appreciated this growing up. I think you just, you just, it's just part of who we are and what we do. But like living over in America now, like I get reminded all the time how many deadly animals there are in Australia. <laughs> and, and you start to really think about it. You're like, oh, how did I survive my childhood? But um, with all these swims, you just mentioned the swim down in Melbourne. I'm thinking to myself, there's got to be sharks out there. Like, do you, have you seen any sharks? I, not in the open ocean. Um, really? sharks when i was like an aquarium but <laughs> it's not this it's not the same so <laughs> i also like if you can see the shark then it doesn't matter it's when you can't see them that it's like a little <laughs> more dangerous because then it's kind of like oh i don't know what's going on um but when i was over in perth like the stretch of beach that we were on is it's just i don't know a couple kilometers from margaret river so it's like renowned yeah. great whites and like shark yeah. attack and we yeah. were swimming around the can, um, the string up. So there's like a string of nine, for those that don't know, surf life saving. And then maybe another 20 meters out is a string of four. And the first string of nine sits around 120 meters offshore. So it's a fair way. Mm. And I got to the first can and there were those like silver bait fish. And there was oh, a yeah. all of them under um, the cans. And I honestly was like looking for the ILB. I was like, is there a shark? Am I going to die? <laughs> I was swimming on my own. Um, mm. cause fairly lucky that especially when it's dead flat a lot of them can't match my speed off the beach like with actually bringing in freestyle kick which is random but um <laughs> I play my own water a fair bit which is nice but because I was swimming on my own that far out I was like oh my god I'm gonna die like a shark yeah, yeah. before they attack anyone else mm. um so I do think about it a fair bit when I am in the ocean <laughs> yeah. and I've done a seven and a half K swim once and like I'll never do it again because I open water is not for me and I think that's far too long to be thinking about sharks <laughs> but anytime I'm in that environment like it is a thought that's in the back of my head constantly but at the same time like we're entering their home and their environment so yeah it's our own fault I guess for putting yeah. ourselves yeah I mean the amount of times I was in the ocean and you know they'd, they'd uh, come out and be like hey um we saw a school of sharks in the area. You guys have got to get out of the water. We're like, nah, we're okay. We're, we're, we'll be good. We just kept, we just kept surfing, you know? When I went to Manly, which was one of the like premier events for surf life saving, um, I raced the iron heat the day before, which would be like doing a 200 medley. So for everyone from America, it's like a board paddle, uh, a ski race, which like you sit on the kayak mm. and, and then a swim and it's continuous. So you do all three legs like continuously. And I did that on the Friday afternoon. And then the next morning we were on the line to do, I say swim heats, which is even like less ideal with sharks and that sort of thing. Like if you're on a board, it's kind of safe, but <laughs> yeah. you're in the water. Um, and anyway, we were like maybe 30 seconds from like starting to swim and the shark alarms went off from a hundred meters down the beach and they'd three bull sharks had attacked a dolphin and then mm. they 
trying to drag the sharks back out to sea so that it continued this event. And then as they were trying to like lure them back out, like three more came in and it just canceled the whole weekend. And they hold oh, us wow. all day at the beach and they're like, oh, like, we'll consider putting you back in. And I was like, I don't want to swim if there's sharks like around. <laughs> <That's-> <laughs> yeah. Taking dolphins. Oh, yeah. I'll be fine. Yeah. yeah. Um, you, you did, you, you did. Let's go back to swimming for a second. You did mention that there, there's still some ground to make up. You got 12 months. Um, one of the things you, you've mentioned a couple of times is you don't have the strongest kick. Do you look at your, your weaknesses and think to yourself, you know, like Katie's got a thunderous kick. Maybe I have to improve my kick more in order to catch her. Like, do you look at uh, where you can make some ground up is basically what I'm saying. Yeah, for sure. And I think I'd be stupid to not look at that. Um, and I've been doing a lot of work with Beck and Emily. So my biomechs that work with us pretty much day in, day out around how I can balance out my freestyle more, if it's worth, I guess, holding a two beat kick a little bit more consistently than a six beat kick, because I find that I hold a higher stroke rate rather than using my legs. So I get a lot more out mm. of my arm than I do kicking. Um, but it's been something that I've done a lot of work on for the 200. And I think as I keep progressing with what I'm doing with kick work and kick cycles and that sort of thing, that it will sneak into the four and then it'll be consistent in the four. And then obviously the eight and the 15, you bring it in a little bit more with that sort of thing but I don't know why I never started kicking when I was younger like I was thinking about this the other day like I feel like when you learn to swim you're taught to kick continuously with like the bubble breathing and that sort of thing and I just don't mm. which is no one's fault it's probably <laughs> my fault for not wanting to use my legs but yeah it's just a weird thought to have. yeah 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 well start working on the kick a little bit but um yeah, that, you, you did bring up another interesting point. I got I got uh, a text message from an American coach the other day, and he was basically confused because you know um, there was a stat that came out that said seventy five percent of the Australian team were from Queensland swimming, and and he was like, well, "What does that mean? Like, what what is Queensland swimming? And aren't they club teams?" Like, he was trying to figure out like where where's the club and and where's the state come into it. So, like from your perspective. What does the club provide for you? And then what does Queensland Academy of Sport provide for the club? So I think I'm in a very unique situation that I'm coached by Michael Bowl and Janelle Pallister, so my mum. And right. Swimming Australia have set up these high-performance hubs and the hub oh, okay. on the Gold Coast, one in Brisbane, one in... New South Wales at N Swiss with Adam Cable. And then mm. there's one on the Sunshine Coast with Mick Palfrey. Vince Rally has the Brisbane Hub. And I think South Australia might have one with Bish. And maybe Melbourne has one with um, Craig Jackson. So they have these hubs mm. that has a physio, or two physios, has the Biomex, has a nutritionist like designated to that hub so that there's a group of professionals in that area that the people that are under like QAS, which is the Queensland Academy of Sport or N Swiss is New South Wales Institute of Sport. The athletes that are categorized under those institutes have access to the hub. So we, mm. I train at Southport Aquatic Center, which is like the home base for the hubs. So those, I guess, professionals with the gym coaches as well, spend most of their day at that one port of call and then other mm. athletes come in and out, even if they train at Bond or at another program. Um, so I think a lot of the work that we do is primarily Bowley and Janelle, but the extra support that we get from QAS or like the Swimming Australia hubs is the extra, I guess, support staff in like physiology and biomechanics, nutrition, physio, strength and conditioning. So it doesn't change the program a lot, but it's more of the extra hands that come on deck to aid the training sessions. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. But then the support. 70, oh, sorry. The 75% of the athletes that are from the QAS are like how many, what's 75% of 30, like 20, that's 66, whatever. We'll say around 20 mm. athletes. Those yeah. 20 athletes are all from a club within Queensland, but mm-hmm. are also under the Queensland Academy of Sport. So that's like, if you hit a certain qualifying time, then you make 
the QAS, which is then like an additional level of support comparatively to if you're not on the QAS. So then we get, I guess, like physios funded and that sort of thing rather than when you're younger, when you like pay your own way through it. So like as soon right. as you're stepping up within the Queensland Academy or like the Swimming Australia schemes, then you get supported in different areas. So yeah, 75% of the team are Queensland and then... I don't know how many are from each other state. I think the rest of them are majority is South Australia outside of that 75%. And then there's one or two from New South Wales and then one from Victoria. Right. I think. <coughs> now, do you have to make the Australian team each year to stay in that 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 pool you know of athletes that are that are fully supported like uh, you know if if you let's say slipped up and and didn't make worlds this year like you finished third at trials would they kick you out of the QAS no so i think it's based on times rather than positions so you could be fifth and still hit the qualifying time so you'd still get the same level of support oh, okay right so it's right. time orientated which i think is a lot more fair rather than position orientated because yeah you could have world number one and two and you could constantly be third and then you'd never right. get that. So if it's all on a time, mm. I guess, deviation from the world record, then it makes sense. Right, right. Now, that <laughs> that type, that level of um, support is incredible, you know, um, that, that there's a lot of money that goes into that. But do they put cash into your account as well? Like, does, does Australian Swimming give you cash? Does QAS give you cash? And I'm not asking for how much or anything like that, but I'm just trying to figure out, like, the level of support. Because, look, it's a very different system in America. You know, like, the, uh, it's, it's just it's nothing like what you guys have. And so I think they're trying to understand it. To be like, well, how is how's Australia doing so well? And so I'm just trying to dig into the details a little bit. I don't know how to say this without getting in trouble. Not in trouble. So again, don't give me figures. I'm yeah. just saying, do you get do you get cash where you don't have to go out and work? Yeah. So once you've hit a certain like so QAS have their own tiered system and then Swimming Australia also have a categorization system. So if you have an international medal, then you're category one, which is tier one, which is the highest you can be across anything. And it doesn't matter oh. if it's a relay, if it's a relay heat swim or if it's an oh. individual swim. So that's tier one. And then I don't know what the rest of them rank as. I haven't looked at it in a minute. But depending on if you're tier one, tier two, or tier three, there's, I think there's three different funding levels. And initially, when I first qualified, it was paid through Swimming Australia. And um, Mrs. Gina Reinhart was the funding for oh. athletes. Mm. And then she is no longer a full-time sponsor of Swimming Australia. However, she still wanted to support the athletes. So now the Queensland Academy of Sport disperses the funds at the same rate that it was when it was done through Swimming Australia. Mm. But now instead of it having to be through the National Sporting Organisation, it's Athlete Direct. So it's Mrs. Ryan Hart gives money to QAS and then QAS gives the money to the athletes on the same tiered structure um, instead of it going to swimming Oz. I'm not sure what the whole difference between, um, I guess, their contract is, but now Mrs. Reinhardt is no longer a formal sponsor of Swimming Australia, so we don't wear her branding on our uniforms or anything anymore, but she still wanted to support the athletes and invest into the athletes directly to allow us to continue to train and not have to have full-time jobs um mm. where out of pulled out of that position as well then i think athletes wouldn't have gotten any funding right gotcha yeah, yeah that makes sense yeah so Qu queensland has stepped up too so does that does that mean then it's more attractive for a top level athlete to move to queensland and and get the type of support that you get there you think um Mm, no, because Queensland still, with like that funding level, still pays the New South Wales athletes and pays the Victorian athletes and stuff. So they still get the same payment, regardless if they're under N Swiss or anything. I think the Queensland Academy of Sport were just happy to facilitate that payment for everyone rather than it just disappearing. But it's been odd with the amount of people that have moved to Queensland since 2021. Mm. Um, mm. You know, 
have a pretty big program over in Western Australia. And now there's nowhere near as many athletes um, over there. I know Josh Young still trains there and there's a couple others that are in and around, you know, starting to qualify for the team, but haven't quite made it there yet. Whereas I guess Bree Thrussell used to be over there and Zach and Surti and Tamsin Cook. So I think after 2021, when coaches started moving, I guess around Australia, a lot of those coaches ended up in Queensland. Um, mm. And we had quite a few move from Victoria after that whole COVID year to Queensland. So I think it was just, and also like the lifestyle that Queensland like offers is very laid back. And when you're outside of training, it doesn't really feel like you're just in the state to swim, I guess. Right. Like I live, I don't know, like a hundred meters from a body of water. So like I can just go for a walk and I can go to the beach and do that sort of thing. Whereas when you're in Victoria, like Victoria is a lot colder. So winters and winter training, especially when you're going into our trials or in the middle of winter. So it yeah. was like seven degrees and it was freezing down there. Whereas we've come back up and it's maybe 14. So it's like a very different environment. Um, and then I think the level of, I guess, all the athletes up here hasn't made it easy for when you've grown up in New South Wales. Because I think when you see the Australian team and there's, 75% on the Australian team, I think younger kids get in their head that they have to move to Queensland to be good, where it's not the case because you've still got some incredible coaches in New South Wales that just don't have the opportunity to develop them because kids move so young. Right, right. Were you uh, were you disappointed that they, they stuck the trials down in a training pool? I was, I, I was like screaming to everybody, like, it's a training pool, it's a training pool, like, because I trained there for four years. So I'm like, yeah. it's not the best pool they could have picked. Uh, were you kind of upset they put it there? When I found out in, it was in Melbourne, I was stoked because I swam so well at short course in Melbourne. Mm. But initially I didn't realize we were racing inside, which I had also never trained in before either. So I just figured like, oh, it'll be the exact same. It wasn't. No. No, okay, no. Like, <laughs> I don't think there's anything <laughs> wrong with Melbourne to hold the event that I think it needed to be held in the outdoor pool considering yeah. the outdoor pool is what's used for competitions all year round. Right. They spoke to i don't remember who i spoke to but they said the only competitions that are normally ever held in that indoor pool are school states yeah. or school events yeah yeah or how it was organized or who contracted it or who organized it but i think everyone's in the same boat anyway so regardless of where swimming australia puts the event right one still has to deal with the exact same environment, the exact same conditions. And even if it is a training pool and it makes the times 0.4 slower or something, then so be it, I guess. Yeah. Well, we felt that racing and still swam decent times. We might go to Japan and the pool might feel incredible and the time difference could just be huge. So I guess everything has its perks and disadvantages, but it was odd that it was indoor comparatively to outdoor. I think that was my only, I guess, quarrel with it. Yeah, well, I, you know, hopefully they get it right for trials, uh, uh, for the Olympic trials. So be in Brisbane, which again is another indoor outdoor pool in the middle of winter. But it is in Brisbane, or they no. I've heard it's meant to be at Chandler, and I really like racing indoor at Chandler, so that's yeah. fine. It's just once again going to be in June, and it's going to be a little bit cold. But yeah, the same boat, and it's it is what it is. Yeah, yeah. Um. Do you, do you feel like Paris is lining up well for you? I mean, you just turned 21. You're, you've got, you know, tons of experience now. Do you feel like this is lining up pretty well for you? I haven't. Not that I haven't thought about Paris because I never want to feel the way that I did in 2021 when I missed that Olympic team. Um, I honestly thought that would be the year that I made the senior team and then I put myself through a, you know, whole list of health conditions and that sort of thing. So I think more than anything – I wanted to race this year and get this year done and cement myself again on the Australian team to give myself more confidence. And then after Worlds, really go back to training and analyze everything and fine tune. I guess get stuck back into a whole lot of work. I don't think, I think once I go home, like I'm not going to be scared to just go back straight into work. Like we'll have a little break or that sort of thing, depending on what Bolly and um, Janelle choose. But I'm excited at the prospect of next year. And I think I had, did an interview um, when I was over at Surf Life Saving and they asked me a similar question. And I think they asked something about missing the team in 2021 and I started bawling my eyes out. So <laughs> I don't think I want to go through that again. And I think mm. by posting similar times to my best time that I swam at Wilds last year and improving upon them, 
is giving me more confidence as an athlete um, that when I go back into training, I'll make another performance shift and that sort of thing. Um, mm. I don't, I really looked at it and been like, I just want to go to Paris. Like, I think there's a quite a few stepping stones before that, that I have to get right. Um, but I think anytime you have the opportunity to wear, you know, the Australian tracks, you know, wear the green and gold, gold is so incredible. Um, it'll be my third fourth team this year so last year there was three in one year which was crazy so this is my fourth and then I'm going and doing world cups to do more race experience in October um and just get used mm. to traveling and racing the people that I haven't really raced against that um much you know I've only done world champs with everyone once so mm. it is kind of a lot different racing in Australia compared to racing internationally I think yeah. I get a lot of nervous racing domestically than I do international as well. I did too, yeah. Yeah, okay, good. I'm glad I'm not the only one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because there's so much riding on it. It's like, man, if I if I miss this team, I'm going to be sitting at home watching where yeah. I want to be and it's miserable to watch. So, But like once you make it, you're like, okay, well, I'll just go, go, go out and race I now. I think you make it, you kind of just like, oh, I can do that again. Yeah. And I think yeah. a lot of times that Australia sets as well, as much as, it was sad watching some of my best friends like miss it by 0.1 or win an event and still not hit like the men's qual time. I think for me, it gives me a lot more confidence going to an international meet where I've had to hit a time that's top eight in the world, knowing that I'm not guaranteed into a final, but I'm setting myself up to be in a position where I'm allowing myself to make those finals. Yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, I uh, appreciate this. Good luck with everything. You know, you got, you got worlds coming up um, soon. You're going to hit a training camp and then, hit the world championships you'll you'll have some awesome competition there'll be good and then like you said you're off to the world cups and then you know preparation for paris so listen hopefully we can catch up again before paris but good luck i'm cheering for you a big fan of yours and, and your mums obviously and and uh and Bollies and the team that you got there so you put yourself in the right spot you're you're in a perfect position to to be very successful over the next 12 months so good luck with everything all right thank you very much thanks for having me <laughs> all right so hi to mum take care i can do that Bye.